Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Spooked, the improvised scary story podcast. I'm Cody Crane, and I'm just here alone today, uh, host-wise. Don't have my co-host here, but today is, actually the day we're recording, is eight years ago today we started this podcast. was the first one that we ever did, and to celebrate our eight-year birthday, I lit all of the trees on fire across Canada. (laughs) <laughs> as, the, as the smog is completely due to me so uh, you can thank uh, our lovely podcast spooked here for that uh, but it's not all about me and my fucking celebrations today it's about our guests here because we have a band that is amazing three times platinum with the song summer girl one time platinum with uh, throw your hands up. One time platinum with, fuck, I always forget the name of the song. So close to the other one. Turn it up. There you go. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we got stereos here. Holla. Thank you for having us. I love that intro. Oh, uh, Pat, Rob, so great to have both of you here. Um, I Yes, I, I grew up in like high school watching Disband. I remember when it was like an amazing thing, like the first season and everything like that. And then watching you guys like grow to like this uh, massive stardom with uh, especially with like Summer Girl was such a big, like inescapable hit. Inescapable. And I I don't know if you guys remember this. Like we were talking a little bit beforehand of like I'm from Brockville. So there was a big like kind of like weird concert that you guys were a part of. Where it was like a a rich farmer in Gananoque did this did this show with like you guys and Simple Plan and Snoop Dogg was there. What the fuck Plain was that? Plain White Tees, bro. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Simple Plan, Marianas. Was uh, Marianas, yeah. like yeah. huge, huge fucking names. And were you at that? <laughs> yeah. Oh so no. You were one of like maybe fifty to a hundred people who showed up. Like, I don't know how, like, maybe it increased throughout the day, but I remember mm-hmm. it being, like, so poorly attended. Poorly and it attended. was like, hey, man, like, I know what we were making per show back then. And there were four or five way bigger artists than us. And they, that guy must have lost his shirt. And you, you filled in a piece of the puzzle there. Because yeah. Because it's funny. We ran into someone last night who was part of that show as well. And we were trying okay. to place where it was. And we couldn't know. We, we knew it was big in the field. And the names w- would have draw. Yeah. But I didn't know it was a rich farmer that put it on. Yeah. It was. Let's, I, let's make that the story. So, yeah. I And I don't know if I'm exactly correct about it all either. Like, it, I've been trying to fill in this puzzle because it stands as something weird to me that no one's, yeah. like, talked about because it wasn't, like. <laughs> but it's a weird situation. That is a seminal moment for me because that was backstage. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the first bands. So we started this band. Like we can go back if we need to, but the like Cole's notes is we started this band and 100 percent legit as punk kids, punk rock in Edmonton, mm-hmm. playing hall shows, and then like all the genres of that. And then one of the first bands I saw who were kind of these punk kids, but they took it to such a huge mainstream level with Simple Plan. Yeah. So they I idolized them, dude. I would study their DVD, and I was just like, I don't want to just play the halls and like have like, I want to, I want to do something so big. And then that day Pierre comes off the bus and say, Oh, stereos, I can't go anywhere without hearing your song. And I was like, like, dude, yeah. that was like a moment for me where it's like, you hear about guys talking about their welcome to the NHL moment when yeah. you're like playing against Ovechkin or something that grew up. And that to me was like, Pierre from Simple Plan just told me he can't go anywhere without hearing my song. It was that Ganon Aqua backstage. And it was sick. They were oh. watching side stage while we were, I remember specifically, I think we were playing Hey Cupid <laughs> and I, it sounded, it sounded, the rare time it sounded really good that day. Yeah. And I looked to the side and they were bobbing their head to it. I remember thinking like, oh, hell yeah, we're here. It's yeah. awesome. It's cool. My, uh, my roommate, I was telling him about uh, doing this episode with you guys. And he was like, oh, check this out. And he was at that Cannon Aqua show too. <laughs> I didn't know him. And he's wearing your shirt. He bought your shirt yeah. at oh, it I and everything that. too. That's Heck so yeah. sick. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, whoa. <laughs> but do you remember it that way that there was like no one there? Yeah. I mean, it felt like, I think I was swept up with just how big of a deal it felt. You know, like... And I know I only went the one day. I, I, th- I think Snoop Dogg was like the, other, the other day. day. Yeah, I think it was two been. days, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and I I just remember it being like such a big deal to me that I didn't even really like clock it. I'm yeah. sure bands it, think about that way more than people. Yeah, think yeah. About yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I mean, it, as far as like playing with like Simple Plan being like heroes and everything, like that's a shared experience now that like yeah. is yeah. so yeah. strange. And that show so is such. So, I mean, like we've got. We, we get back together and we talk about those days mm -hmm. all the time. And that show is such an outlier. It's, <laughs> it's so fun that we're talking about it now. Because that's just the weirdest show. We played a show on a boat one time in that same era. And now I thought that was strange. We were we were floating on the water while the crowd was on the other side. Yeah. No intimacy <laughs> so whatsoever. Um, but that massive stacked bill. And then all, and like uh, the one rare occasion at a festival where there were enough washrooms, there yeah. were enough gates, there were enough oh, security, yeah, there no were enough there. fans. <laughs> like, it That's was so unreal. Cool. We the went back there, though. Nice. Ganon Aqua did like Winter Games or something, and oh, it was a sick yeah. show. Oh, yeah. So we, we, we made it up, had a good Ganon Aqua show after. But yeah, that, that place stands out, that's for sure. I was kind of back and forth about, about it because I was like, you guys do so many shows over the years and everything like that. Like, are you going to remember? Oh, yeah. But I was like, but this was a pretty weird one. So yeah. Yeah. You'd be surprised, man. Like, <laughs> obviously, that one that. stands out for all the reasons we you just mentioned yeah, but like yeah. i find that like 99 percent of the time when someone mentions the show I, I get there and i'm like yep i do remember that one like it's very rare where i'm like i literally don't know what you're talking about <laughs> i mean that's what we we're there to do well uh, let's get into uh disband a little bit here because this is like the big like kickstart right and when you were going into that show, what was kind of the feeling? Because like it's called disband. The people tell you to stop being a band. That's wild. Were you <laughs> were you at all like this is all or nothing kind of thing at that point? Yeah, and so here's the thing about our band, and I think we like we've talked before we started this about <laughs> sports and stuff, and that was yeah. like one of the first things I fell in love with was sports and all this. And then the analogy I always use is you know when you hear like this second string quarterback or a rookie and he'll say yeah i think i'm as good as tom brady and everyone's like what are you talking about you're not <laughs> but you need that mindset mm -hmm. because the day you show up and you're like i'm not as good as this guy you've already lost because no yeah. one's going to do it for you so i remember we got the call we were about to go play football and we were a band probably three or four years at this point so mm -hmm. we're already like we lived together in this rundown house that has since been demolished practicing every day in the basement every day this was our life and we got the call uh, from Greg Norrie, who is uh, in Treble Charger. He like basically produced uh, yep. Sum 41, huge name, and he ended up hosting the show. I have an opportunity, because he had wanted to work with us and was trying to find a way, and they approached him about disc band. He's like, there's a show, we bring bands out, we judge them, and I missed the call because we were playing pickup football, and I heard this voicemail, and I hung up. I kind of get emotional about it, man, because it was just such a funny thing, and I was like, this is it. We're going to go on the show, we're going to be the best ones, and they're going to make us they're much music band. And dude, yep. this, we had nothing. Dude, I had no money, like like money, possessions, anything. We had nothing other than we just knew we were that fucking good. We knew it. Yeah. And I know that doesn't sound humble, but it's that's an everyday process, man. We no. Our first tour, we got to Kelowna, and this is as pathetic as it is awesome. And before we got to the venue, no one knows who we are. We're like the yeah. opening band, one of 10. We went to a gas station, we unplugged the ice machine, plugged in our hair straighteners so that when we got to the venue, we looked done up and people were like, who are these guys? Before we played a note. Yeah. Like our yeah. look, everything was so dialed in that we had the confidence. And I know this is a long way of answering your question, but no, no, no. dude, it, there was no nervousness going into this show. It was exactly like, okay, finally, this show is going to serve what we've already been doing. We don't need a stylist. We don't need people to write our songs. You know, I'd already written Summer Girl at that point by myself. Yeah. So we just knew that we had this package as a band and it, this was going to be a launching pad and it honestly played out Almost to a T how we predicted and it. just to add on to that too, Pat mentioning us being in bands for the year before, right? Or the, all the years leading up to that as well. So like all the members in stereos, we were all in different bands together in some form or not. So we were used to like that punk rock style touring of like playing in the US to like, I dropped out of grade 12 for it. And we played, my first show ever was in uh, a gay bar in Santa Monica. And I loved it. I was still like supposed to be in high school, supposed to be doing like my homework down there. And I knew I will never go back to a normal life. So when we had that opportunity and seeing what happened, like, like my goal was to be on the Warp Tour, you know, and yeah. to get that much ahead of it was just insanity. It was so cool. Yeah, it's true. It's one of those things where, well, I, I mean, I completely get to where, where you're saying too of like walking in with confidence. I mean, like I do like the acting stuff and do these like conventions and everything now, 
And like, I, I'm no big deal, but I'm walking into these auditions like I'm fucking Tom Cruise and I'm yeah, doing man. these conventions like, you, yeah, you want my autograph kind Hell of thing. Yeah. Because that's what you have to do in this industry. You have 100%. to have that kind of... I, I just read a story about Prince when he was first starting mm -hmm. in Minneapolis. And before anything, before the hype or anything, he decided that the 7-Eleven in his neighborhood, he just wouldn't go to because he's too famous in his head to be there. And yeah. he knew already that he would be at a level before anything. So he started practicing that. I used to think that was arrogant, but I think there's something to that, right? You're, you're showing yourself and other people that this is what I'm here for. Like, this is ready. It's cool. It's super cool. That's like why Prince is Prince. And, yeah. I, and you watch, like, I don't know if you saw that Mike Judge, uh, like, uh, series where he was he did like a docu-series where every episode's on a different artist but it's all like animated like king of the hill I've style about this yeah yeah well, that sounds incredible and he does one on prince and they're talking about it and like all of these artists are like ah oh, prince is such an asshole and everything but like that's why he's prince too yeah totally yeah. and it's from an era too and I think yeah you know it's funny for us with the only hitch with this band is they were like okay this is an opportunity and like everything in this fucking industry you think it's going to happen next week and mm -hmm. a year from then you're maybe going to start doing what you plan to do. But I remember the hitch was like, listen, like you guys are from Edmonton. They're only like getting Ontario bands and there's no, like they're not paying the bands. So, and we were laughing. We're like, Oh no, dude, we got, we've been sleeping in our van in Walmart parking lots yeah. for yeah. three years now. We'll, <laughs> we'll drive ourselves out there. We'll stay in our van. And they're like, really? Oh my God. And he ended up putting us up, but like, he didn't need to do. We would have, yeah. and we would have easily, we were already easily. sleeping in our van to go play the 13 kids in Winnipeg, driving back to jobs that we had like just quit hoping they would take us back. Like and, we yeah. got this. We're like, no, don't in worry. In the about first that. band, I slept on the roof of the van <laughs> in Roswell, New Mexico, on two separate occasions. <laughs> that's a once in a lifetime place. I've been there three yeah. times with that. Well, band. that's like, where you get picked up by a UFO. I, was, too. I think I was trying. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I've given you everything you need plus consent <laughs> yeah. to get out of here. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Good way to go. Uh, it's uh, it's so uh, cool to think about, though. I mean, when I when I think about like just disband and like uh, where you guys uh, took off at that point, I think that there's multiple um, things I think about here, but. And I don't want to uh, put you in like too small of a genre or anything like that, but um, just for the purpose of this, that in general, like pop punk was the biggest kind of thing at that point, right? Definitely. And it was like the genre and people were like kind of springing off and you, you guys added like layers of like kind of like hip hop to it a little bit and everything yeah. like mm -hmm. that. But that was the thing. Like, everybody was listening to that. And now maybe we're more into, like, uh, I think more of, like, a rap era is, like, oh, what our era yeah. is now. But And I, I'm thinking about that and how, like, great it was to kind of launch at that moment. And then also just the opportunity that I don't think Canadian music industry has anymore like much music was, mm -hmm. right? Like... We used to go home, run home, and watch the countdown, and it was important oh. where you landed on it. Totally. And also having a show like Disband and everything like that, like you, the support system isn't something that like new artists get anymore, right? And no. I, I feel so lucky to be a part of that much music scene mm -hmm. because you know, growing up, when we when we got to perform in that in that space, I just specifically remember being like. There was a, a live, I think it was called like Interactive and Live or something, but Green Day played in the warning era. Dude, Intimate and Interactive. Intimate and yeah, Interactive. So and it was just incredible. And then you see that space in real life. And I, I, so much music I discovered would be off the punk show or the wedge at night. And then that's when, you know, when, those all, when, when Nirvana was in the top spot all the time. And then, you know, the pop stuff came in. And it, it's, it really was like such a cool hub of like Canadian music to find you. Like I didn't know, I, I, I was so young back then, I didn't know that like different countries had different artists that didn't cross over. Yeah. I thought like, I remember thinking Gob was worldwide. That's I think the most- yeah. I was about to music, bring up yeah. the same thing though. Like it <laughs> felt like the way that they built that thing yeah. was that you had no scope. Like yeah. when you talk to Americans now and it's like, oh, you don't know who Swollen members are? Yeah, like they guess. felt like the biggest yeah. fucking deal no, to us. I, we, I was just listening to them yesterday yeah. for the first time in like 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had uh, Mad Child alone come and headline a show at, in Brockville. <laughs> like, How was it? It, it, it? it was weird. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it was like the... Dun -dun -dun -dun. 
And Mad Child brings it home. And then you just wait for the rest of it. What, he only did his parts? No. (laughs) (laughs) I was going to say, that's so funny. (laughs) So good. What a respect for um, Prev One. Is that his name, I want to say? Or was that the DJ? No, Rob the Viking was the DJ. Rob the Viking was the DJ. Yeah, Prev One. Prev One. He, uh, yeah, he was the only one that didn't come. We got Mocha only. Mocha uh, only. Two. only was sick. Uh, yeah, he yeah. he came, headlined a show, and I got my like swollen members CD like oh. signed by two of them, right? That and I was waiting for Prev on. One. He was the one. Yeah. No, never well, they came. were so tied into like skateboarding and snowboarding, and I yeah. loved that. Growing yeah. Up, right? like, it was just awesome. <laughs> I think that's the you touched on it though. The most important thing about all that is mm-hmm. that much music made uh, Canadian bands gave them this platform and this image where they looked as big as any other artist out there and i think mm-hmm. you get so much buy-in like there's you know we would kind of lament at the time we were big it's like man if we were 10 years earlier we'd be like multi-millionaires because we sold really well and we like the metrics were yeah. there but streaming it was like line, like man i posted a tiktok about it the other day and it was so funny because we'd have kids come into the line and be like i can't find your album on limeware they didn't know that that's so fucking insulting. It's like, yeah. please buy it. You know what I <laughs> yeah. mean? But we did okay. Yeah, yeah. But then now we're seeing we're a band 10 years later. Mm-hmm. Holy fuck am I glad we were a band when we were. Because yeah. we were still able to make some money on yeah. music um, and things like that. And I think Munch Music was a huge part of that. It's like this band is big and it makes you f- like, it, I mean, Canadians make some of the most worldwide epic music. Look at the biggest artists in the world. Many of them are Canadian. Drake, yeah. The Weeknd, Bieber, right? And like I could go on forever. They're all Canadian. Mm-hmm. Nickelback. Yeah. Um, in every genre, but we also the industry I feel has this like inferiority complex where you need Americans to tell you it's cool for it to be like actually cool. And yeah. Much music sort of like was that middleman where it's like, look at this band, they're big, and it like people are like, okay, they're big. It was almost the only time that the uh, entertainment industry in Canada was doing it right. I we, couldn't agree more because it never happened with like TV. Like you, you knew like, oh, Corner Gas is a big show in Canada. Yeah, and, yeah, but you knew it wasn't. But it, it has that yeah, Canadian yeah. filter. On. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I would say the like shows like Shit's Creek kind of changed that. Yeah, the, yeah. I, the, the Netflix Letter is Kenny, kind yeah. of bringing it over a little bit, I yeah. guess, and everything like that. Um, yeah, it's really interesting. I I w- want to talk about a little bit here um, because, and I'm going to. It's going to escape me. Uh, what the name of uh, this like song is, but it's the group collective that's like playing in the Cineplex right now. That's for mental health. Yeah, kids' cell phone song. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Art of, uh, uh, f- live uh, out loud. Feeling out loud. Feel out loud. Feel, Feel out, out loud. loud. Thank you, Rob. Um, yeah. So feel out loud. I'm listening to this thing. And then I don't know if this is for sure, but I'm willing to put it on, and blindly say and put it on my money here that. You must have been at that time. I was doing the math. Wave and flag was around the same time. Were you in, involved in the wave and flag so too? I've, I was on. I'm on kids' cell phone, the new one, and I was on wave. And you got to be one of the few to cross over. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a good point, man. To be on both like that hey, far great apart. Point. That's great uh, point. It's it's it got me my uh, third string quarterback Super Bowl ring, which is <laughs> I have a Juno. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's because I was on that song. Which you is have so a Juno. That's all that matters. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't matter how you that's get the it. the way I tell it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's a that's so funny. Like, there's so much now. Like, the reason we're even in Toronto right now is being nominated for an award. And to sort of see, like, to get those, it's, it's just great perspective to, like, have been on big songs back then, to be nominated for Junos back then, and then to still sort of be, fuck, man, around. Just lack of a better term, we're still around. And we're still in those spaces. Um that is where, you know, in our old age and wisdom, we're in the uh, uh, gratitude era of this band, where I think that we had spent so much time uh, being, you know, so stubborn to, like, moms, dads, girlfriends at the time, family members saying, like, are you sure you want to drop out of school to do this? And be like, yes. And then you're right, right? And then mm-hmm. you feel like you now have this chip on your shoulder. It's like, I was right. I went against the odds. And you feel like you deserve everything. Like the whole honor to be nominated. We didn't feel yeah. that way about the June. I'll be honest. We thought we should win. Yeah. We thought we were robbed that Arkells, which is now one of the best, best. bands ever, <laughs> beat us. They should have beat us. Yeah. But at the time you feel robbed, and now it's like the whole like, oh my God, dude, like we're still yeah. being, you know, nominated alongside Tegan and Sarah, who robbed us yesterday. <laughs> Just, kidding. Like, thank Just kidding. Gosh, they did. They're awesome. Yeah, they're so <laughs> yeah, good, but yeah. we're in the same conversation, man. That means yeah. fucking everything to me. Everything. No, that's cool. And I mean, you're talking to a guy that's been nominated for so many uh, 
uh, podcast awards that's never won. Um, so uh, awesome. I feel you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But We're all the, the Buffalo the Bills of uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of awards. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, um, if it makes you feel better about the Arkells winning, I did see uh, them in a show that I would imagine was a nightmare for them because it night. was. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh, finally, our payback. Yeah. <laughs> we love them. Um, yeah, we do love them. No, for the record, I, they're so sick. I dig them, too. Uh, the problem was that the lineup for this thing, the way the show went, was first on was Cancer Bats. Oh, I can yeah. see where this know where is going. going. Second on was Arkells. Yeah. Third on was Billy Talent. And okay. let me tell you, people were not feeling Arkells after... Cancer bats yeah. just like was it's moshing like and Bush going on stage after corn at Woodstock. And I'm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm all in on Team Markels and that we do. Yep. We got booked for a thing called Scene Fest. I don't know how if mm-hmm. that's like province wide, but it's a, you know like every time I die I was playing um, Cancer kind of Bats. Love yeah. those bands. Mm-hmm. Love that music. Oh yeah, we've too. always loved. Like, again, that's yeah. kind of where we started. Like I, we didn't know what we were signing up for moving out here, man. Edmonton, the music scene. Like say what you want about Edmonton was mm-hmm. the fucking best, dude. You'd have pop punk bands, ska bands, hardcore bands metal bands maybe even a little bit of like pop coming in there and playing the same fucking hall show they're all friends they tour together yeah. and that's what we came from yeah. there was no like man what like who's playing um who's headlining who's playing set <laughs> like who cares yeah. you know what i mean and we were getting then we started seeing the industry where it's like you oh, you guys can't open for them it's like well is the money any different no you're getting paid the same but you got to play live we're like we don't care yeah. yeah anyways so i've been in that situation where we played festivals and the whole crowd is like metal the difference was though is where we played the stage. People mm-hmm. fucking loved us, but then yeah. we were walking around the, to different venues. Yeah. People were like, "Fuck stereo!" And, 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 <laughs> you know, that was kind of hard for me, truthfully. And like, that was an attitude thing for me because like, I I love heavy music, mm-hmm. and I really still connect with it a lot. Yeah. And to me, that's just such a, a missing message with it because like, to me, watching Cancer Bats and Arkells, hell yeah, mm-hmm. cool. Let me fix my palate here before that, right? Like yeah. that, that's why I like it. And there there was so much of a divide back then, and I felt misunderstood with it, and like. It, I remember that show specifically because we like in that we covered Rancid at that show and that's mm-hmm. not a weird thing we did for that show we would play Rancid every day if we could yeah like, we love that stuff but you don't have to just stick to one thing you can like anything you like and that's yep. why we're friends because we loved Hatebreed and Gorilla Biscuits and AFI but we also loved Mariah Carey and Lil Kim and it's the most that's yeah. how you sum up this band and when you say like pop punk was big at the time we're kind of I feel a lot of people refer to us now as like that era of pop punk, mm-hmm. whereas it sounds like semantics, but we were like punk pop because I think the dominant genre we were was pop. Yeah. But we played it as this like live band with like we wanted big sounds and like we wanted to be rock and roll, but they were pop songs. Like make no mistake. And then like I have self awareness now uh, looking back on those. No wonder they fucking hate us. The way we were marketed was probably like everything those guys yeah. hated about music. Mm-hmm. I think now you have to have an open mind. And if people hate a band, Good luck. Like yeah. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, you know? like, For, I, and you, you're allowed to like any form of art you like, yeah. and not like whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, I you mentioned uh, AFI, and I do have a small story with this too. But mm-hmm. I I gotta mention uh, your hair back then. Yep. Um, yeah. yeah. Was and I was trying to think about like what I was rewatching the music video and I was trying to think about like where this like hairstyle that was common too, mm-hmm. like the jet black. And and I was like, is this an is AFI the starter of that? June 28th, 2000. 2000. I was already obsessed with AFI. Mm-hmm. This is pre internet being what it is today, and I didn't know what they looked like. So I already loved this band, I yeah. loved the songs, knew every word. But I didn't really know what I was signing up for because all I had was a CD book and his look was kind of changing. Mm-hmm. This guy comes out, full fucking pleather, shiny, purple devil lock, black lipstick, black nail polish. I had never seen anything like this. There's pumpkins on stage. Again, this is in June. Yeah. And first song, my life changed, dude. I quit skateboarding. I quit sports. I was like, I like it was the best thing I'd ever seen. So to answer your question, yes. Yeah. AFI <laughs> is the reason I do... Everything I do in my life is because that band changed yeah. everything for me. And the funniest part is if you were to listen to Summer Girl, this auto-tuned out like hip hop vibe song, I don't think a lot of people are saying, yeah, AFI is like got this kid yeah. in the music. They probably would have <laughs> hated that, it. Like <laughs> AFI, specifically AFI strung out and rancid. Mm-hmm. When we first met each other, we connected over that. And I don't know if a day goes by in our like lifetime friendship where we haven't talked about one of those bands yeah. or referenced. And it's obviously like, a different genre completely, but I think it was this idea that you like look a certain way 
And if you sound a certain way that doesn't follow the rules, because dude, yeah. I fucking remember when I would go to hall shows mm -hmm. and people would, and this is like before that would be like AFI sold out. And the reason why is because they were like had choruses. Mm -hmm. And like this band was still playing to 500 people and hall show crust punks are like yeah. sellouts. And I was like, they can good. Move. Whatever they're doing, it's <laughs> yeah. different. That makes people like react um, passionately one way or the other. Mm -hmm. That was the blueprint for what we did with Stereos Man. And like it was this love hate, but it sure as hell was different and stood out. Like it was, and that's, I to this day love that we're that. I, uh, this is uh, my AFI story. It's pretty short, but <laughs> uh, I'm, a big AFI fan too. Um, I mean, like uh, Silver and Cold, and just that first. I think that's the first album. Is it? Oh. it's no, so it's it's so not the first album, but yeah. it's the first album it's, where they were on a major label and uh, yeah. broke into yeah, it, sing the sorrow. There's about six before that. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Okay. yeah, but it's like fuck. It's not the same. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I remember loving that. Um, but when I was living in Vancouver, I was going to acting school. I'm uh, sitting on the patio of this uh, coffee shop. And um, the guy next to me is like kind of a, a new friend. He was in my acting class. And then I just see a person walk by and I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's the singer of AFI. Oh my God. And he was like, what's his name? And I was like, I can't think of it right now. So he like Googles it, yells it, turns around and it's him. Oh, wild. And he comes over, he's talking to us for a little bit and everything. Oh. And then um, at the end, he's like, hey, um, I'm going to this like opening of an art exhibit. Sounds like do, you, <laughs> do you guys want to come? What? Oh my and, God. And my friend, before I even say anything, he goes, Oh, uh, no, sorry, we're busy. And then I was like, And then oh. he's like, oh, Okay, no problem. He said, Bye. I'm like shell shocked. And I was like, We're not doing anything. And he's like, Yeah, but now he's going to think we're 10 times cooler. I'm like, We're never going to oh. see him again. Yeah, so you played the rules of the game to him. <laughs> yeah. So I just want to sum this up. You had an opportunity to go to an opening of an art show, which is so Davey. Yeah. With him, invited by him. And you said no to play the cool role. Not you. Your friend said no. Yeah. Okay. That is unbelievable. I'll never forget this. That, I'm that, so I don't, funny. I'll never I don't, forget is, this. It haunts have, me for life. Could you even have gone? What do you say? I would just say every, I would agree with every opinion he said. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, I, 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 I probably would have left a worse impression, maybe. What year-ish yeah. would you say this is? I would say it's got to be around 2011, I would say. Okay. So we're, we're in those at... weird, like, Crash Karma years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, not so Crash Karma, whatever it was, Crash, crash, crash love. love, yeah. Interesting. Um, That's cool. I'm so jealous. I love the band El Trio, and Matt Skiba was my Davy Havoc, too, essentially. And when our band was big, uh, we got on the guest list to go see El Trio, and then we went backstage, and we were talking to him. And he did the same thing. He's like, let's go play pool or something. Or he, he specifically requested in, like, 2009 or 2010 to not go to a discotheque. And I was like, I'm going to say that for the rest of my life now. <laughs> he was in the cab and we were going to a cool like pool hall on college. And his, a and like, I think we had a reputation for being quite the party guys, which he did too. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting in the middle of the back of the cab and my other best friend over here and Matt here. And I was like, this is happening. And I'm going to be an Alkaline Trio by the end of the night. And his manager pulled him out. And it just, it, it was so close. And I just wonder, had we played that pool game, what would we have talked about? Or same thing, would I yeah. have just left a way worse impression? <laughs> and he would have left on his own. You know, what could have been? Yeah. <laughs> then he joined Blink-182. <laughs> I want to uh, go into uh, the newer album here now. It came out in November, Cheap Thrills. Yes, sir. Um, I'm watching, uh, so I watched the, back to back. I watched the Summer Girl uh, music video again. And then I watched uh, I Want Somebody. Yeah. Um, and then I, I nailed the AFI. I think I'm going to nail this. We got a George Michael thing going here. Holy uh, fuck, yes, dude. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> sonically, to me, it's very Prince. But <laughs> aesthetically, very George Michael. Yeah. And holy shit, I love that you said that. Yeah, I'll take <laughs> yeah that Pat looks great in that video. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I w I, yeah, I'm like big time into George Michael. In fact, like, it's so funny you say that because we obviously, like Rob and I are the most i would say image not obsessed but like it's a good thing we like like yeah, you know yeah. we want to look fucking dialed in dude like it's part of it and when i was like sending we always were like what dude it'll be like we'll go be going to an oiler game and be like yeah. what are you wearing tonight we did it for so the airport. we did this for the video for sure yeah for the airport like what are we, what's the vibe for the airport are we casually looking cool anyways as pathetic as that is um i had like an entire george michael like collage uh for that we shot like four videos in two days actually that's wow. the other side of that because we live in Edmonton still, so we have to like kill as many birds as we can with one stone. Um, and that for that video, George Michael was 
like the entire look. So you nailed it. <laughs> it's I, a faith video, I think. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's everything from the faith video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I love the song too. Only explicit one on the album. It is. I, I did pull out yeah. that. It's first yeah. serious oh, song yeah. I say fucking. Doesn't that yeah. feel good? Oh, uh, yeah. Fuck. Yeah, we're, we're tough now. How yeah. do you strategically pick the fuck? It just got has to make sense, man. Yeah. And I think now that's like, I might say fuck a little bit more too because I don't think it matters as much. Like the role radio kind of plays in terms of like the whole thing behind the band. You have to be conscious of that, um, but less so now like it, with the yeah. way streaming comes yeah, out. So yeah. to answer your question, I don't know. It just felt like the right lyric. Yeah, I, and I love that song. I, I can't think of uh, right now the next track after it, track four though. That one's more like folksy too, and I, I really dig that one too. Way back home. Way maybe. back home. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It's kind of got like a folksy vibe to it. Is that what? Is it track four? I don't know. Yeah, I'm just gonna check. It sounds like based on what you just described. Like stereos is such a. That's the thing about pop music, man. Mm-hmm. Is that the idea of pop music is that it would be like the lowest on the the rung of the ladders of like meaningful music, right? Mm-hmm. To me, I've never understood. Like, it, music is art, right? We're, we'll all agree on that. So you get into acting. You get into, let's say you're a director because you love film, okay? Mm-hmm. How many people would be like, dude, what the fuck? You like horror movies. Why are you watching a comedy? Yeah. That doesn't yeah. happen. No. Yeah. So why does it? why is it any different when people are like, dude, I remember you guys were punk kids. You're playing pop music. Dude, I fucking... The first song I really fell in love with, really, when I was four, was fucking She Drives Me Crazy by Fun Young Cannibals. And I made my mom play it over and over. I was at the radio. It was pop. It was fucking yeah. Tiffany. It was these things. I wasn't into AFI, which didn't exist <laughs> yet born when I was AFI. four. You know what no. I mean? Like, pop music plays this, like, cool role in it. So the album, I, mean, I don't even know why I'm going off on this tangent. The, this album is so stereos because there's, like, 30 fucking genres. And I remember being in the studio being like, what genre are we? And I love that question. I, I never want to lose genre. that. It's yeah. stereos. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. never want to lose that. And and exactly that and to 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 be able to non put it in a genre yes we came from a certain scene where you can say mm-hmm. because we have tattoos in our certain way that it was pop punk hardcore whatever you want to call it but you know when we were leaving the awards show last night we were just having a nice little walk through toronto we've had some of the best conversations in our life over the last two mm-hmm. decades you know <laughs> and we were thinking like it's still that like that's still what sets us different is that we don't care we don't yeah. care about that like i don't care about my punk rock cred and stuff you know because it's an attitude and i know i embody that and I think it's the most punk rock thing ever to be like, cool, Mariah Carey is awesome too, right? I don't, yeah. I can't be a follower in that in that stuff, and it's it's just awesome. Yeah, and uh, listening to them uh, back to back to, I had both albums uh, playing as uh, my gym playlist all this week. Nice. Um, which uh, that first album really pumps you up in there. That's all like <laughs> uh, pretty, that, yeah. yeah, I like that. Yeah, and uh, this new one too. I I mean, I love how you guys have the same, like you have the same vibe, you have the same sound. And honestly, this new album puts the first album in a different perspective to me where I did see it in, in like a different That's kind cool. of kind of light and everything like that. And I was like, oh, because I'm listening to um, Cheap Thrills and I'm thinking like this has a real like 80s kind of vibe to it, oh, like yeah. that kind of 80s pop and everything, you know, and it, and I really dig it. And then I'm listening back and I'm like, okay, we, we kind of had this here too. Like we, mm-hmm. we really did. And I think that like the big, uh, the big change, which didn't end up being that much of a change anyways, where you still have that same vibe is that auto tune in the first album uh, yeah. is a big part of it. Right. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's still that it's still this vibe. It's it, you guys did a good job of like, kind of like, it feels like you transitioned into kind of a more mature avenue, but still keeping the voice. Well, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about all the rad times in stereos, mm-hmm. but what, you know, behind the scenes, and I'll talk about this very openly, and like that's why I'm so happy that, you know, Pat was part of the Feel It Out Loud song, because mm-hmm. I suffer from a lot of mental health things, and they were all going on back then, too. But then putting that level of stardom and then substance abuse comes in, too. Like, there was a lot of, lot of hard lessons that, we both had to learn over the last, you know, decade before we re- rebooted the whole thing. And it's, there is a maturity, whether, I mean, we're just older in general, but we have seen some things and survived some things. And mm-hmm. it's cool to hear that that kind of comes out on there as it, well, right? Because we're big advocates of that whole thing. It, it definitely does. And in general, too, it's really fun 
to, and I don't know if you guys ever watched like the old music videos back or anything like that too. Yeah. A little bit. But, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> but just to see how much all of you have just come out of your shells even yeah. more. Like you didn't think about it watching those videos back then. Oh, but yeah. like watching them back to back, it's like, okay, these guys got the vibe. You guys are having looks like 10 times more fun oh, yeah. out there. It, you're it, so much more comfortable. Yeah. Like you're like just like the vocal performance of what you're emoting to is like all there and everything. And you're like, you, you just can't help but smile watching it, you know? That makes me really Thanks, happy. Thanks, man. That, that, exactly that means it. a lot. because And that's the thing is like even something like the Summer Girl music video. Mm -hmm. We shot that, I want to say April but this is a month and a half before the song was released, meaning we weren't we, had, we weren't big yet. So we sh shoot the video for the song. The extras don't really know who we are. They don't know who the song is, so everyone's pretending to like vibe to the song yeah. they never heard. And it was like a good production, but like me on camera, I remember feeling like, what the fuck do I do with my hands? I know. I didn't have a microphone. <laughs> yeah. And again, I'm not a pop star. Like I'm not like a, like I, that wasn't me. It was like Mike swinging. That was what I did when <laughs> yeah. I wasn't singing. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. It was this whole like punk rock thing, foot on the monitor. And it's like, no, you're like standing in front of this like, retro cherry red like lowered car and you got to sing to the camera like this and it's like i don't know how yeah. and then you even like fast forward and watch a video not even the, the the recent ones which is so, so different but like something like turn it up where it's like okay now we're on tour now we have like a following and things like that and i can see the confidence and where it's going i even see it in the disband episode because not a lot of people mm -hmm. know that the first part of it is so fucking reality TV real. That is me, and I see it in my eyes. I'm like, oh my God, that kid is like really chasing his dream. Like mm -hmm. the second part was we did so well on the first part that they were saving us. So we were actually the third band to shoot this band, yeah. but we were the season finale because they saved it. And then they shot all this subsequent stuff where it's like, you got to get out and play a show for Gene Simmons. Dude, we already lived in Toronto. We already signed. Yeah. So like, but they're faking this like, if you play well, you're going to get signed. We are already signed. Obviously, we wouldn't sign a contract on TV. Yeah, with you know no, what I mean? no lawyer with present. No lawyer. Yeah. Like, but that's like not that. sexy to have the lawyer there. In reality, <laughs> we used the lawyer that they suggested for us and got jobbed. But anyways, um, <laughs> the but like the, but that whole like thing, like it's just like on your point about being comfortable and seeing where it mm -hmm. starts and where it gets to. And I can see it in my eyes, dude, from a music video. I can be like, oh, this guy's like day off on tour was turned it up. Yep drunk the whole time yeah. and just like waiting to just like go to bed and kind of like you know not checked out because i don't think i ever didn't love what we were doing but it definitely felt like there's a certain point where it felt like we you stop feeling so grateful for it and you feel like you belong there now that's good because mm -hmm. the moment's never too big for you you perform well because you don't feel pressure but also you're there's a lot less of the like holy fuck what were yeah. we doing you know what i mean we we went to this award show last night and lost and we're like, this is fucking amazing. <laughs> and this is so sick. Look at us. Like we're yeah. filming our video as yeah. one of the nominees when it says our name. Yeah. Like we're just like, yeah, oh, this is so good. Like surly assholes before. And what was cool too is <laughs> there was a band from um, Bonneville, Alberta that we really, Pat and I really believe in. Shout out FKB. FKB. <laughs> um, and it's just cool to see Berta Boys killing it in Toronto because yeah. there's such like, we're not all what you see out there. Like Edmonton yeah. and Calgary are cool spots. Um, think of it as Austin. It's the Austin of Texas. Yeah. Like we're the cool spot, <laughs> um, and I saw that was their biggest show last night, and they had won the, at playing a show like a battle of the bands at the Drake, and they got to play at this their biggest crowd, and I saw it with them, and I was talking to them afterwards. I was like, I remember that feeling, and I think it was Fifty Cent that said, "You're oh, the best thing ever to, is the rise. It'll ne you'll never feel that feeling of that initial yeah. rise, whether it's a comeback or not. And believe me, I'll feel it this time if the comeback works. <laughs> but that initial rise, I, it, it was a euphoria." that I just didn't understand. And then it becomes an everyday life, and then, then that's when you can see it in the videos where like, oh yeah, these boys have had a few. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to, uh, we probably won't have enough time to do the improv at this point, but I do <laughs> know. <laughs> we get us talking, man, and yeah. on it. No, I, I, I loved it. I love uh, talking about all this stuff because it is uh, such a big part of my growing up too, you know, and like, uh, so getting like the behind the scenes and everything is so interesting. And I do want to dive into a spookier note here Let's because go. we got to talk I about I feel like it. your listeners are going to be fucking pissed if we don't. So yeah. It's probably time. Yeah. I don't want to hear about Are they going to talk about ghosts yet? Mm -hmm. <laughs> At least auto tune the doing. ghosts. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but do the two of you believe in ghosts? Yes. It's a great question. Um, Yes, it depends what definition of ghost would be now, but uh, for the for the most part, for what we're talking about this podcast, absolutely. I've seen way too much shit. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I, I like how, so, because I wasn't sure. We talked a little bit beforehand, and I knew that, Rob, you, you obviously were a ghost believer like me. Yeah. But you said that uh, Pat would bring us down, and or, or possibly to the level, but you yeah. were pretty confident in yes, too. You believe you in know, ghosts. Yeah, I don't know. What, so what Rob is uh, trying to status. articculate <laughs> is that he's literally, like, obsessive about a lot of this paranormal stuff, <laughs> in, in not a bad yeah, way. No, of course and that I am just kind of like... Oh, that sounds weird. But I believe, I fully believe in that stuff. But what I think he means is that I am a, like, as he posted on his Instagram story, I'm a muggle when it comes to so this stuff. Like, we I need, think we it's need the real. Pats. We need people like Pat. Yeah. Because if not, I'm tinfoil hat, you know? And <laughs> it's good because I can be like, this, 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 and this, and oh my God, this. And I think that balloon floating in the wind is from this and that. And Pat's like, well, it could have just been the wind. And I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> this is a good thing. But every now and then we we stumble on a story or a tale or just tell a ghost story that we both are like equally as like holy fuck and we have seen some shit man like yeah, we have. yeah back in the days like we saw some when we were the when the band was first starting we saw some really weird things a lot what uh, please dive into this so there was one show um, where we like Pat's house Pat's childhood house has been like the center of our band for so long in St Albert Alberta just outside of Edmonton. And this is before, before like old lineup. Um, no, I think we had played with Shiny Toy Guns yeah, I think or Ill right. Scarlet or something earlier. Mm -hmm. And it, we were starting to play bigger shows in Edmonton, but we weren't talking with Greg Norrie or anything yet, but we were just still living the dream. And mm -hmm. I remember anytime we got momentum, we were feeling really good. We just see little things. So it's maybe midnight or 1 a.m. And we're pulling up to like this beautiful street he lives on, like big overhang trees. And I thought out of my and I have to question this because I want to see these things right so that's why I like to see if other people did I thought I saw a figure that was far too tall maybe from I'm sitting in the passenger seat of the van trailer behind us pulling up onto the side of the curb to load back the gear into the house and I see this figure that's so so tall maybe I would say 10 feet okay but I don't see clear shapes I see the fuzziness on the outside and I see dark like like piercing red eyes like using a crosswalk and then disappearing into trees I choose not to say anything for 10 seconds, and then I had to make a joke. And I was like, I just saw something wild. Three different guys were like, I just saw it too, I just saw it too. Sarah, my girlfriend at the time, was like, oh, you saw that, I saw No, that I didn't realize she saw it too, yeah. that is wild. And I didn't <clears throat> see it, but I remember it being like, well, they're not all fucking making this up, you guys all saw something. Mm -hmm. Cause like, she would not have fucking <laughs> just agreed with that. There was a time where, oh, sorry. Hello. There was a time where we, uh, <laughs> Man, it was like one of the biggest pivotal moments of this band. It was where Rob, uh, uh, Dan, who also founded Stereos with us, and myself decided that it was time to uh, explore other options uh, that led to the breakup of Stereos. It's like, and it was like, it was a tough conversation, man. You know, you've mm -hmm. worked so long to get this, you get success, and then the industry happens, other things happen, egos happen, and we were just having this like real heart to heart. I think you had just flown in that day because he was living out in LA, and we were basically like, Okay, we're gonna do this. We're gonna have some tough conversations. We're gonna, but move forward with this new project. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And then, the neighbor's house. The, it had this swinging like uh, on the on the deck. You know, like deck furniture. You get a fucking Canadian Tire, and it's just a swinging thing. So it's, but I do this because it's important. It's yeah. it swings like this, and it's all hinged, right? And it was immobile because there's no one out there. It was like 11 p.m. and it starts swinging this way, really violently shaking. And we're. I remember it being like, what the fuck? Like it moved in the way that it shouldn't. And then I don't know if it's you or Dan climbed up to see like, is there a fucking rack? It still shouldn't move that way. Yeah. And there was nothing on it. And we have It wasn't wind, right? It's that. not like moving. It was like shaking sideways and it was so fucked. And we're just like, I mean, I'm sure like everything you could have a skeptical try. opinion on what it yeah, would be, yeah. but it was just so counter to physics and reason. And now, this happened. Yeah. And then you still decided to break up after so that. So here's the it's thing. It's telling you not to. Every time, every <laughs> time, well, is it, or is it scaring us? Right. Because every time we seem to be on a great path with music and living mm -hmm. a good life, scary shit happens to shake you. Right. Mm -hmm. And I forgot this. And this will tie into disband, but the house we moved into that they see, they, they hooked up there and everything. It was in Scarborough. And there was an Armenian family living there that had said, you know, someone had died in this house. And that's when I was like, just so, so into this stuff. But weird things happened there. Scary weird. Um, we had two girls come visit us that we knew from back in Edmonton. But we were on, they were staying there a little bit and they wanted somewhere to stay. And I think we had to play down in, in Windsor. And their story of what happened while we were gone in that house is haunting. Didn't they have to leave? They had to leave. 
like and these are people that would never talk about ghosts and and, and or demons or whatever you think of that stuff like it was wild what, what did they say like yeah what i was, know the whole thing oh please okay so um one was staying in my room and one mm-hmm. was staying in dan's room now when you come in the front door uh directly to the left was dan's room you would turn go upstairs into pat's whole loft classic lead singer or you would go around the corner into my room. So they were in there. Now what I heard was there was the back door access that they kept hearing open and the toilet seat was up, but there was only two women home. So that's a scary thing at first. It's like, oh shit, male intruder, this is brutal. Melissa in Dan's room, I shouldn't use the names, I guess. Mrs. M, too late now, <laughs> um, was laying here, foot of the bed. And I think she, she was reading something. She was reading something or just falling asleep. And we all, when we moved to Toronto, all we were allowed to bring was single mat- mattresses. So like a single mattress on the floor in a house. And she said from the door frame, she saw a black mass creep in. And again, I know this woman, she would never be into this stuff. And she said she felt pure evil, like pure fear evil, and then disappeared back. Sarah then heard the door opening and closing and then was wide open. And they're like, oh, someone came in and this happened. And it happened throughout the entire night to the point where they had to go get a hotel. I had all these like promo posters of all the everybody else that was on Universal Records so it was like you know like Young Jeezy and like uh, to like uh, whoever any other band's yeah. posters and all fell at once um, uh, we uh, the sound guy that we brought from Edmonton said that he woke up in the middle of the night and there were shadows of like demonic things flying around like I would not be able to like go very often without dreams where I was and I'm sure everyone has this I've mm-hmm. talked to people they all get it but I was like being like it feels so real because it's almost like a waking dream, but I was like taken out of my bed and like flown around the house into other yeah. people's rooms and you're having conversations with people and you wake up and you're in bed and like whatever, but they were just so vivid and it happened so often and they only happen in that house. Like they just stopped. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like that's, this is not yeah. the skeptic part of me, but this is the part of me where I like really do minimize. Like I'm not cr- saying this is anything, but it was fucked up for me to experience. Yeah. So I don't know. That might be for the experts to be like, oh, that's a thing. I don't know. I have no idea. But I do know that there was an energy around that. The energy is is what mm-hmm. I believe certainly most. affected yeah. things, and you know what, man? Like, if you want to get into it, like on a deeper level, like I don't know how much your thing ties into any like sort of spiritual level. No, no, yeah, yeah. But yeah. for us, like that's where our egos and attitudes changed uh, irreparably going forward. We mm-hmm. were boys, man. We were <clears throat> fucking best friends. Mm-hmm. Like, <clears throat> and you could just say like money like girls partying uh again like just everyone telling you you're now the shit that's obviously those are real explanations for behavior changing Mm -hmm. the other side is like we were so fucking solid man we worked our asses off to get there and that's where you know i became a lead singer but i was also not just a lead singer on stage not just in interviews or on like to other people i started being a lead singer to my friends that's not cool yeah you know what i mean and so dude we didn't drink and so when we started out in edmonton we never were in that party scene. And people thought we were like losers. So, like those guys practice every night. You don't need to do that. But then when we got our opportunity, we ran with it. Yeah. We go to Toronto, start partying, start drinking, start just like being not the people who got us there in the first place. And so again, it could be just, you know, that's how the world works and we're humans. That's like human nature. Or there's something fucking negative in there that never changed until it, it, the banquet. It's definitely something that you become like kind of like reliant on in a lot of ways too like especially with like nerves and stuff like going into uh things i know like doing like uh stand-up comedy and stuff like that it gets so easy to be like oh i need this like beer before i go on the stage and everything like that was the story of my entire life yeah Yeah. and then eventually you start going like oh if i don't have a coffee today then i'm probably fine you know or something like that yeah, but like it, it, it's interesting but yeah I, I i definitely know that spiral i i mean the kind of like paranormal i kind of believe in um is more along like the lines of like uh residual energy kind of thing and 100%. also just like being and i don't know if they can like i don't know if i believe in like a f- throwing things off a shelf or anything like that it's plausible in the world mm-hmm. of energy, though. You yeah, know, you know when Nikola Tesla has that quote that says, "If you want, the, if you want to understand the universe, think in frequency and vibration." And I think there's so much to that. But that residual energy, yeah, at the most negative times in my life, you know, like I had drug issues, I had alcohol mm-hmm. issues, I had mental health issues, and I didn't believe in any of it until I had to hit a rock bottom and heal from it. That's when all that shit happened to me. Now, you know, a Newtonian law is um, uh, the power of, or what's it called, the attract laws of attraction, or something mm-hmm. like that, right? Um, it just makes so much sense plausibly or like 
um, all these ghost encounters come um, from an abusive house. That house, that that energy is there and it's haunted. Yeah. Like, we all have a story, whether you believe or not. Where you walk into a place, and that's why they're doing it on shows now, where they don't front load people and tell them like, "Oh, someone died here." You can feel it. Yeah. Like I've felt that my whole life, and I remember we we played our first band played in Manhattan maybe a year or two after 9-11. And I saw it and I felt crushed by that negativity and like just that negative energy and so much death being around there. And any place like that, you feel it. And we're, so I think some people are more receptive to it, but that residual energy, is, it's real. It's yeah. a real thing. I truly believe it. I, I think that it's like my kind of belief is that from my experience and everything like that too, is that it's a lot of just trying to make you like empathize and pushing their like emotions onto you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And like you'll feel down or you'll feel that existential dread or that sadness that they're feeling. Like I, I was at this, um, I lived at this one place um, and I just moved in there um, with a partner. We were moving in together and she kept on saying like, or I guess we discussed it after. So I kept on having these reoccurring dreams of this woman crying at the end of the bed. Oof. Ah, oh, fuck. And yeah, that's done now. <laughs> and I, and then I would go in there, and sometimes I just had this like, like, like almost like this like ball of sadness just like go in me, and I'm like, oh, I'm so depressed right now. What yeah. the fuck is happening? Oh yeah. And I even at one point saw this like, and this was classic Toronto basement apartment, a bedroom with no windows whatsoever. So there's no entrance of light anywhere and i just see this glowing light from when i'm in the kitchen and i see it coming out of the room I'm like what is happening here and when i go in there it's just this orb of glowing light that's like illuminating the room mm -hmm. with what? no light and on you're it. awake and i'm awake yeah Holy shit dude and I then like talked to her about it and she's like oh yeah i have these dreams about this woman crying oh, at the end of the bed and too that's me like i can just tell when when like I look. I used to look for it so so much that mm -hmm. when it happened, I'd have to be like, if somebody else didn't see it, I'm probably just creating these things. Yeah. Like, and I believe in that power of the mind so much, but um, I'm sure. I feel like we all have had an experience with a partner where you just some people are feel they feel haunted, and I think I was for a bit too. Yeah. And there's this whether it's a residual negative energy or not, but you feel it attach, and it is so fascinating. And it for me just proves everything I truly believe in. You know. Um, but I've been to locations that like I did. Um, do I have time to record a quick story here? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I went on. I went traveling to um, uh, Hong Kong with my ex-wife, um, my ex sister-in-law, who is a neuroscientist, absolute skeptic from Harvard. Okay, and me and my ex-wife were super into this, and we were doing some of the classic tourist stuff. And this was at the height of my my paranormal obsession. And I said, you know, I found this place in downtown Hong Kong called the Namku Terrace, and it was a schoolhouse in the old days but when japan invaded it became like a very not okay like a brothel that was non-consensual right. you know what i mean okay. and there was a news report years later about four um teenage girls that wanted to do a night over there and they had to call the police due to and this is the quote that really, really made me feel sick was a nauseating possession and i in middle of the day summertime hong kong i took me and camille and this and and uh, laura there and Skeptic was like, oh, let's go drink. Let's go do something fun. We're walking up the steps. We're not even 15 feet away. My, my ex-sister-in-law just froze and was like, we can't be here. We can't be here. And she never recovered that day and was sick and quiet and never, ever told us what she saw or felt. But it was the scariest thing to just witness her do it. And we went and like drink absinthe after that. And that's a fun time. And yeah. she still was just... And that, when those people get affected, or like, and that's a, I know, like, Pat and I are on the same level with a lot of stuff, but when he reacts to it, it scares me more because I'm like, oh shit, I want to see this. Yeah. But, um, oof, that, that, and you got, it lingers with you too, yeah. right? You got to clear that stuff. Like, I, I'm, I'm a big, like, I sage all my stuff. And if, mm -hmm. I just, I can sense people's energies. And if it's weird, I just don't mess with it anymore. I just get too affected by it's, it. I don't know if you find this, but like, it, it's a lot of the time. And I mean, being from Edmonton, you got the biggest mall there. But, like, we, even when I go into, like, the Eaton Center, I find that there's, like, so much energy going on totally. that I'm immediately exhausted upon, like, entering the place. Th that's exactly it. And the older I get, I notice that more. That is uh, – and I think that's exactly it. So you could, like, try and explain things like that very practically mm -hmm. and be like, well, is it, like, a self-fulfilling prophecy? Like, it's a, it's, a, it's almost a joke. It's like a TikTok. Like, yeah. you go to the mall with your girlfriend and immediately – dude, like, I remember this with my ex – 
I don't know what it would be. If we were in a store where I was looking at stuff and interested and might buy stuff, I'm all good. The second we go into fucking dynamite, <laughs> I'm dynamite. exhausted. <laughs> I'm just like, ugh. And so, like, that's a funny anecdote. Yeah, but then yeah. the other side of that is um, I went to Europe with my family, like, uh, when I was in high school. My sister was about 11. And uh, my sister and I have always been very close best friends, but it was a, you know, you're with your family, summer holidays, every day together, there's going to be some fights. My sister and I are at each other's throats, fighting, just like whatever. But that's the day we went to Strudhoff, which is a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. in, uh, it's in France now. Uh, and we just stopped arguing because it was like something was completely sucked out of you the second you start going in these buildings reading the stories right like it is like just it absolutely devastates you and then years later we went back to europe as a family family of nerds and we went to Anne frank house and it was the same sort of thing i don't think we were fighting that day but it's just like no one really feels like even just talking mm -hmm. and i think both can be tr like it's the same thing in different obviously extremes whether it's you know these places of extreme sadness and death or a shopping mall why wouldn't there be the same sort of effect with of positive or negative energy that just yeah. like think about a mall is it really like the happiest place probably not for a lot of reasons yeah no uh, and uh i always think about this like story that's both funny and sad um but like just the i, I think it was like in japan there was like this guy that was so sick of um waiting for his wife to stop shopping that he just jumped off of the thing and killed him, which is an insane story yeah <laughs> it's so oh, it, it's you gotta think work wasn't going well yeah, yeah it's gotta be another factor it's just the shopping he just couldn't that's take it anymore plane. Do one for the boys you yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's that's I'll think um, about that all day now but uh you saying that you're uh you went into the Anne frank house i think what you're trying to tell me is that it's not just justin bieber's signature that's in that book <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so funny. Oh my God, yeah. um, I've heard that story from a lot of people I know that have visited that house. A yeah, friend of mine in the summer went there and said the same thing. It's, and you're front loaded with those places, though, yeah. right? And and when you're open to that that level of like energy or spirituality or whatever, I I still know that I'm looking for it. Yeah. But what I try to do now is I feel intuitive and I, I like to just open myself up and say like I'm down. If someone's if something's around, let me know. And every now and then something will happen, and I just I can either really go wild on it or I can just say okay well I believe in it kind of just solidifies where I like to be spiritual I don't want to push it on anybody but just like okay cool I've just seen I've seen too many things I've seen synchronicities coincidences um good things bad things demonic whatever you want to call it I've just I've seen it all and I just I, I'll never stop being fascinated by it that's for sure well, I'm. Yeah. We definitely have to have uh, the two of you back on here yeah, again. Sometime. Dude, this is fun just chatting. Yeah. I love this. Yeah. This is what we'll be doing today, anyway. <laughs> no, yeah, dude, yeah. it's true. Yeah. <laughs> just getting hopped up on coffee, talking about fucking sports. ghosts and sports, ghosts music, and sports. man. Perfect. I love it. Well, uh, where can everybody follow you? Um, to make things easier, just follow me. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Um, we're basically at We Are Stereos on every platform you would use. I think we're at Stereos on Facebook, but the big ones, Instagram, TikTok, you know, um, and then, you know, obviously just Stereos on Spotify. But that's where you can find out anything going on with us. And tell all your friends that we're actually back. Yeah, please tell your friends. And that is, like, the best part about this band is that, like, Man, every single day there's people who are so happy and thankful that we're back and it makes us feel good. And for anyone out there who listened to this and is like, I fucking hate these guys, we like you too and we yeah, like man. getting chirp. <laughs> it's actually a defect I have. I like it as long as it's funny. So yeah. if your chirp was like, you're auto tune, it's like, okay, well, I'm not offended. That just sucks. It's like yeah. not a good, but if yeah. you can like chirp us pretty good, um, please bring it on. I like and it. If you listen to the show, they're into cool shit. So we have that in common. Yeah. 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 And yeah. at the end of the day, nothing matters. And uh, you're all cool, I'm sure. Keep on rocking in the free world. Amazing. Well, we'll be uh, sharing this at Spoot Podcast as well. And go uh, to check out Cheap Thrills. Um, is, is, can they buy physical copies? Do people do no, that these days? No, well, we do get asked um, <laughs> about that a lot, but not mm -hmm. enough for it to, like, you know, I sound like an industry guy now, for it to warrant the cost and yeah, return yeah. on investment in making physical copies. I mean, I listen to it on Apple Music, so oh, yeah, that's, a, I I that's a spot. Yeah, so, man, it's just, and I hope people like even one of the songs, and if they do, then that's fucking... I think they'll like more than one. I, I think, I don't know how Apple Music works, but, like, 
one song has a star beside it, and I'm like, is that the most popular I one? I don't know. Or actually, like, you know what? I, I think it's the it's the one that's it changes a lot based on the amount of plays of that day, and it is so interesting where it goes to. Yeah, like it, if it's this time of year, it's going to one. If spot. you could choose one <laughs> like song for girl. people to check out on the new album, what would it be? Um, if you're gonna listen to one song on the new album, I would definitely say the very intro song sets an example that shows you we are in a very cool place. What's it and called? It's called Out in the Wild. My favorite song on the album is, so I like the bookends, I guess. I like the start and the finish yeah. of it. Thousand Days at the End. And it just couldn't be more different, but it really encompasses who we are, in my opinion. Cool. It's just been interesting, the ghosts. Amazing. It's interesting. The, do you watch I Think You Should Leave? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. The ghost house one <laughs> is my <laughs> fucking favorite. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> that could be a whole other hour long. Oh, man. <laughs> now we're, I'm not I, trying to have anyone have the worst day at their job. Yeah. <laughs> Don't want to ruin anyone's day. I just watched that sketch again yeah. yesterday. Yeah. Like, uh, I was... Good. Yeah. Oh, man. It's interesting. The ghosts. <laughs> Uh, but uh, go to the sonarnetwork.com. You can see a full profile on both Pat and Rob with direct links to social medias and everything like that. As well as go to the Sonar shop. You can get a spook t shirt. Whether you believe in ghosts or don't believe in ghosts, we have a shirt for you. Spooked. This podcast has been brought to you by the Sonar Network.